Pastor Ryan here as we uh, begin our um, our study this fall on spiritual disciplines, and in particular, we'll be using Donald Whitney's book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Um, this is the first week of teaching, and we're going to cover the first three chapters of the book. Uh, this will be the longest section of the book, or the, or the most um, book that we are going to cover uh, in any single week. So this video, this teaching may be a little bit longer than some of the others. It, it may not be. We'll just see how things go along. Um, I invite you uh, to get that book if you don't have it, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald S. Whitney. Um, and if, uh, if you don't have it, um, that's all right. You can still follow along. Uh, but there will be several topics as as he out uh, as he lays out uh, several topics for spiritual disciplines, different disciplines, um, and then has an introduction as well. So one of the things that's true uh, that that Donald really highlights that I, I I really like about the book is he he starts with the why question, and 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 to me that essentially is why should we engage in these spiritual practices, these spiritual disciplines? What, why does it matter? What's the purpose in our life? And Donna Whitney says that, um, that the purpose is for godliness, uh, that we are more godly when we practice these disciplines. In the Anglican and Wesleyan tradition, uh, the, a term that may be used for these disciplines is, uh, is the means of grace. Uh, John Wesley in particular, and, and Hooker before him, talks about the ways in which our engagement uh, in these disciplines are essentially like us uh, wanting uh, to get wet. And if you want to get wet, you, you, you go where the water is. Uh, right now I'm sitting inside. It looks like it may rain today. If I want to get wet, I, I'm going to go outside where the water is, where it begins to rain. Or perhaps I may uh, go to uh, the lake. And, and sit myself down in the lake, that would make me get wet. But if I just sit here in, in my office in the midst of this and say, oh, I want to be wet, I want to be wet, uh, unless someone comes in and throws a cup of water on me or something uh, that is pretty far-fetched, that's not going to happen. So what happens is that, that the means of grace, these practices are places in which we put ourselves. They are practices in which we engage for the grace of God to extend to us, to be bestowed upon us. Because when we are engaged in these activities, or as we will see a little bit, lack of activity, we put ourselves in the right frame of mind, in the position for God's grace to come to us, to flow to us, to flow in us, to flow through us, to transform us. Here at UPC, we, we talk about what our mission is, that we are called uh, to be grounded in Christ, and that as we are grounded in Christ, we'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we might be transformed to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. The disciplines are ways in which the Holy Spirit comes into us. They are methods and means which God uses that we might be transformed to be made like him. And oftentimes, the disciplines can seem like a daily drudgery. It's just something else to do. It's something on the to-do list that I've got to read my Bible. I've got to have prayer time. I've got to engage in stewardship. And they can seem like drudgery if we don't keep our eye on why we do them. I, When I was in junior high, I played the French horn. I, I was never good at the French horn. But I played the French horn. I played at the French horn. It's an extremely difficult instrument to play. Uh, for those of you who know anything about instruments, but one of the one of the things that had to happen was that you had to practice for a minimum amount of time uh, each day. And I can tell you this: that for anyone really who's tried to play an instrument, but not only does it matter how long you practice, it matters how engaged you are in the process. So if I sat there with my French horn in my lap and I would practice, I would have the music before me and have a pencil there and maybe I might doodle, maybe I might hold the instrument up to my lips and not really do much, just go through it. And oftentimes if a concert or a chair test was far away, that's kind of how my discipline would go, my practice. It wasn't with intent. 
But then the night or two before a chair test, when I really wanted to move up among the, there were four French hornists in our, in our band, then I would really begin to buckle down. Or when there was a piece that I really liked that was meaningful for me, I would really practice very hard. And, and when I did that, I did it not because it was necessarily more enjoyable, but because the fruits of my labor mattered. So one of the reasons why that we engage is so that we would be made godly, so that the, the ways of God would flow more easily through us, so the fruits of the Spirit might be something that, that we don't have to try to manufacture, but rather they come, they flow out of us naturally. I have a friend, and he came over, and he was looking at the piano, and he sat down at it and began to just play effortlessly and flawlessly a beautiful piece. Now, if I were to sit at the same piano, it would sound clunky and terrible and probably even out of tune because I haven't mastered the ability to play the piano, even though I took lessons. I, I'm not a master. I don't have the freedom to just sit and play as my friend Jay does. But he did that. He has that freedom that the music can flow through him because of how much time he has put in practicing. So my prayer is this, that as we go through this seven-week study, um, if you go through this with us, there are many of you who will be watching these videos and then coming on Sunday or on Wednesday to be with us either in person or on Zoom, or perhaps you're just somebody who stumbled across, um, across our website, or you're somebody who is a part of UPC, but you're not able to participate in the small group discussion, you are certainly invited to, to, to go through these lessons whenever you find them or whatever time you have. But always please do so knowing that, that, the, that the point of this is not to complete a task. So much in American society is to say, I've completed a task, we check it off, and, and then we're done. But that's not how the spiritual disciplines work. They're not simply an activity to be checked off so that it's done for the day. They are activities to be engaged in so that through them God might transform who we are, that we might be made more like God. So the first week this week, as that's kind of serves as our introduction to this study on spiritual disciplines, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at Bible intake. It's chapters two and chapters three in, in the Whitney book. Uh, and he outlines really six ways for us uh, to, to have the word imparted to us. And so we're going to just briefly kind of go over those six ways. I'm going to talk about them and then we'll discuss them more as we meet on Sunday or on Wednesday. But the first thing he says is he talks about hearing the Word of God. Now, hearing the Word of God is something that we should be in the regular practice of. In the first century in particular, most people couldn't read. In fact, for most of history, the world couldn't read. Oftentimes, we think of stained glass windows as being beautiful, but stained glass windows really were semi-permanent or permanent coloring books that would tell the story of Scripture because people couldn't read. One of my favorite uh, cathedrals or, or chapels in the world is, is, a, is a chapel called St. Chapelle. St. Chapelle is actually surrounded by buildings at this point, but it, it sits in the middle, uh, on an island in the middle of the Seine River in, in Paris. And most people go to Notre Dame at the very end of that island, but in the middle of that island since, sits St. Chapelle. St. Chapelle is, is known for its beautiful stained glass, and you can certainly Google St. Chapelle or, and, uh, and, and, and find that uh, stained glass. But the interesting thing about it is that most of the time you see this wide-angle picture with all this stained glass and the flying buttresses that hold the walls up because the walls are essentially all glass. But when you're there and you walk through it, you see that the stained glass actually tells the whole story. The story of scripture from Adam and Eve in the garden. So creation, Adam and Eve, and it goes all the way around. It tells about the Old Testament, Abraham, the exile, or Moses, uh, and, and the Exodus, the exile. It goes all the way around 
teaches about Jesus, and then it concludes all the way on the other end. If you were to watch the whole, whole chapel, you would see all of Scripture unfold before you in basically a lit-up coloring book. And it ends with the restoration in the city of God, heaven coming down from heaven to earth. People could see Scripture, but most of the time they would hear Scripture. That's why we gather on Sundays, to hear the word proclaimed, to read Scripture, or to hear Scripture, to hear it, uh, the 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 preacher to unpack scripture. I think oftentimes in our culture, we think that that what preachers do is they just tell people what to do. Um, and that's that's not what preaching is. Uh, for those of us who gather on a regular basis or even get in, engage in in worship together you know, on a on a on a not regular basis, perhaps just special occasions. We know that, that when we gather, what the duty of the preacher is to do is to expound and to explain what God is saying through the words on the page. Because we believe that scripture is active and living, that it is alive and it is fresh, and God has something to say to us today. And that's what preaching is. It's just revealing and unpacking what God has said in the Bible. So hearing the word of God. The, the second uh, thing that Donald Whitney brings up is reading the Word of God. He says, oftentimes we don't read the Word, and not because it's difficult. Most of Scripture actually is not difficult. There are places in Scripture, please hear me, that are difficult to understand, but, but most of it is narrative. Or most of it is, is, is Jesus teaching in parables in the New Testament, or, or a logical teaching that's outlined as in the Pauline epistles. It's not that it's difficult, it's that we're lazy and we don't engage in it because we have other things that we would rather do. Our eyes are full of the videos that we see. It's too easy to get lost on YouTube or to read the, the, your social media feed rather than opening the Word of God and reading it. But reading is the second way in which we take the Bible in, in Bible intake. The third way is we study it. There are many uh, great devices for that I have laying here. Uh, this is my Bible, and, and this looks huge. But it, the thing about it is, and that's going to be backward in this video, but this is an NIV study Bible. And so for most of the pages, and I've just flipped randomly, uh, the, the text will be backward. I understand that. But if you see the text at the top, you as I duck under here, you also see that at the bottom, it's full of notes that help explain, that help, that help you or I just to study the word, to put it into context of what is going on in the rest of Scripture. We are called to study the word of God, to hear the word of God, rightly preached, to read the word of God, and then to study the word of God. That's really summed up in chapter 1. In chapter 2, Donald Whitney talks about three other ways that I think are more difficult, actually, and take more time. And when you talk about just reading Scripture, that's one thing to check it off your checklist. But these are actually harder things. The first one is to memorize Scripture. To know what God says in such a way, so intimately, that you can call it to mind immediately and when it's needed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Now that may be a common one. That may be a place to start. But there are other, other passages that, that we, might, uh, we might dwell on and we might think of. And I'll tell you this, that as a pastor, I've done a little bit of scripture memory, but this is not my strong suit. It is, it is hard work for me. And there are many times that, that I, I know what it says, but I, I can't say where that I can't say where it is. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And I know that brothers in that passage is, is, is siblings, brothers and sisters. It's the masculine in the Hebrew, but it stands for both male and female. Behold how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity, says the psalmist. Right? Those things are important. And the more that, that we are shaped by the things that we memorize in Scripture, 
then that's what shapes us rather than things in this world. The next thing uh, that Donna Whitney says is a way in, in which um, we, uh, we study scripture is to meditate on scripture. So I'll just use that when I think in, in these times when we're fairly divided, it's important for us and even to meditate on behold how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. What is unity? What is unity? What would it look like if we were unified in the church? Now, it's one thing to read that. That's a, a short passage. And if you were going to do scripture reading for 10 or 15 minutes a day, if you were going to do, you know, you can read through the whole Bible in a year, reading for about 15 minutes a day. But that would be one verse that you would read. And you could just gloss over it and just say, I finished my reading. I read my, you know, four chapters today or whatever and close the book and, and have nothing to do with it. But, but it's another thing to meditate. What, would it, what is unity? Behold how good and pleasant. What is good? What is pleasant? How can we promote unity by how we live in such a way that the good and the pleasant is lifted up? To ruminate on that, that's, that's my word for meditation. To think more deeply about a small passage of Scripture. And the other thing, the, the sixth method, he says, of Bible intake that's important for us is application, that we would apply the word. So it means that I have to live my life differently in light of what I've read or what I've heard the preacher say or what I've studied or what I've meditated on or what I've memorized. It means that the Bible intake is not primarily about what happens in our brain, but it's a primarily about what happens in our heart. It's not primarily about knowing so that I know so I can win Bible trivia. It's about knowing so that my life is now different. The spiritual discipline of being in God's word because we believe it is active and living. So that's the introduction today and, and talking about Bible intake. Thank you for uh, your time and, and coming to, uh, to, to spend this time as we look at, at these opening uh, passages and begin to think about and journey together uh, through the spiritual disciplines. We're going to be at this for seven weeks, and so this is the first of, of, uh, of a series of seven uh, passages or seven videos that will be displayed here uh, on our YouTube page and on our website uh, and also be emailed to the congregation. God bless.